Welcome back again, everyone. Laszlo Montgomery here. Welcome to the China History Podcast for 11 years running, consistently ranked in the top 10 China History Podcasts. So rather than chit-chatter away about ways to support me by going to the website at teacup.media and the new Tea History Podcast, which I hope you've already subscribed to, let's get straight into the action. Last time we looked at the small states and dukedoms of the Zhou dynasty, who were all squeezed together in a shape that very much resembled the borders of Henan province today. We also got more acquainted with a few of the major cities, both their ancient appellations as well as their present-day names. We touched on the earliest origins of Zhengzhou, the present-day capital of Henan, but only so far as its establishment in the Zhou dynasty and the founding Duke of Zheng and the state's two most famous sons of yore, Zichan and Shanbu Hai, both being among the archetypal hero scholars, philosophers, statesmen, and capable right-hand men to the king or emperor whose deeds and writings earned them respect, praise, and admiration by the people who studied them throughout the ages. But we didn't get much farther than that, and the first thing I'd like to do is pick up where I left off in that cursory glance at Zheng Zhou's beginnings and do a deeper dive. This is one of those Chinese cities that I dare say, is not too well known outside of China, despite its historical significance. Today, Zhengzhou is one of the powerful pistons inside the engine that powers the China economy, both at home and because of its key role in the Belt and Road Initiative, internationally as well. I only briefly mentioned the city of Xinjiang last time as being part of that short-lived Pingyuan province that lasted 1949 to 1952. Xinjiang was the capital of that province. It's located in between Anyang and Zhengzhou. So anyway, I just wanted to mention that this is the city in northern Henan that was the site of the Battle of Muye, the historic encounter in 1046 BCE where the last Shang King Zhou met his Waterloo, falling to the Zhou dynasty co-founder King Wu. Zhengzhou is the premier city in Henan province. Its history goes way back before the Duke of Zheng, all the way to the Xia and Shang, and served as an early capital for those dynasties. There is a treasure trove of Shang artifacts buried under parts of Zhengzhou, a great deal of them, I'm betting, still waiting to be discovered. Partially discovered in 1950 was the Zhengzhou Shangcheng, the Zhengzhou Shang City, from around 3,600 years ago, the earliest years of the Shang. This site predated the ruins of Yin and Anyang. You could still partially see the 26-foot-high rammed earth walls that were excavated. The downtown area of Zhengzhou was built on top of this site, where the Shang kings once ruled. Archaeologists are still working on the site. Like most of these oldest cities in BCE China, Zhengzhou's location throughout the centuries shifted around the map. Remember last time prior to the founding of the state of Zheng, after the flight from Haojing, Du Quan founded a city named Xinjiang, or New Zheng. And I mentioned last episode that legend has it, this area was the birthplace of the Yellow Emperor. In terms of Zhengzhou's most ancient past, the cities of Dengfeng and Xingyang are probably the most historically noteworthy areas. Dengfeng, in the southwest corner of Zhengzhou Prefecture, contains perhaps the most famous parts of all Hunan. This part of Zhengzhou, Dengfeng, was built right at Mount Song, famous the world over as the birthplace of Chinese Kung Fu, as well as the location of Shaolin Temple. This Buddhist temple, besides its association with the birth of Kung Fu, or Gong Fu, was also where Chan, or Zen Buddhism, got its start. The Taoist Zhongyue Temple and the Confucian Songyang Academy are also located there, making Dengfeng important to the big three religions of China. Buddhism, Taoism, and Confucianism. This part of Henan is also significant for being referred to as the center of heaven on earth, 
and was considered back then as the only location in China where China's earliest astronomers believed you could make accurate and reliable observations of the stars and planets. Collectively, all of these many places are lumped together by UNESCO as the historic monuments of Dengfeng. These ten buildings, named by the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, were constructed over the period of nine dynasties, and also included the observatory at Gaocheng, uh, whose construction was ordered, it's believed, by the Duke of Zhou himself. Let me just interject here and mention at my website at teacup.media, I have all these Chinese terms from each episode listed for you, and you could actually download a PDF of these terms. Pinyin, Chinese characters, and English translation. Even for students of Chinese, it's often quite a challenge to keep so many terms straight. So I welcome you to go check that out. Last episode in part two, there were more than 130 Chinese terms. So don't be shy. If you drive an hour northeast of Dengfeng and Mount Song, in the western part of Zhengzhou, there's the city of Xingyang, another place filled with archaeological relics that go back to prehistory times and those Neolithic cultures discussed in part one. Xingyang, among other claims to fame, was the spot where the legendary Chang'e, the moon goddess, ascended to the heavens. Everyone who follows China's lunar exploration program will also recognize Chang'e's name for the lunar orbiters and rovers on the moon. They're all named for this moon goddess. Chang'e, who legend has it, took off for the moon from Xingyang. Shan Bu Hai, by the way, he came from Xingyang, which, as I previously mentioned, was first part of Zheng and later part of the state of Han. And the wife of the Yellow Emperor, the Empress Leizu, also known as Xi Ling Shi, discoverer of silk, she too was said to have come from Xingyang. And lovers of Chinese chess, or Xiangqi, they can tell you all about Xingyang. It was here in 204 BCE, that the two contenders for the imperial mantle worn previously by Qin Shi Huang met to iron out their differences. And these two were, of course, Liu Bang of Han and Xiang Yu of Chu. They met in Xingyang to work out some agreement about divvying up China between themselves. And there, in Xingyang, Liu Bang and Xiang Yu met right at the Hongko, the Hong Canal. When all the negotiating was finished, these two bitter foes signed a treaty that handed to Liu Bang all lands west of the canal, and Xiang Yu took everything to the east. And just like when Don Corleone embraced Bruno Tattaglia at that meeting, this agreement was supposed to keep the peace between the two rivals. Well, needless to say, the peace did not last in both cases. And for this historic reason, we get the midline on all Chinese chessboards that's referred to as Chu He Han Jie. It all comes from this famous meeting in Xingyang, Henan province. And because of this, Xingyang became known as the Xiangqi, Wenhua Xiang, the hometown of Chinese chess culture. And if your surname is Zheng, Xingyang, now a county under Zhengzhou Prefecture, is called the origin place of all people with that surname. Li Shangyin, who I featured prominently in that eight-part series on Tang poetry, also hailed from Xingyang. And less than 90 minutes away from Zhengzhou, on the other side of the Yellow River, in Wen County, is the town of Chenjiago. This was the hometown of Chen Wang Ting, who lived from 1580 to 1660. And during his lifetime, in the late Ming Dynasty, tradition says that in Chen Jiago, he developed the Chen style of Tai Chi Quan, one of the five major styles practiced all over the world. Others claim Tai Chi was created by the legendary Taoist master, Zhang Sanfeng. Like all the earliest development of Chinese martial arts, the origins are enveloped in myths. So Henan is not only the birthplace of Chinese Kung Fu, but Tai Chi Chen as well. And this is a topic that I 
regularly get asked to cover. Be looking for that one day soon. Anyway, the future Zhengzhou city and most of central Henan was incorporated into the Yingchuan Commandery, one of 36 set up in China by the Qin state prior to the unification in 221 BCE. And during the Northern Zhou Dynasty in 578, Southern and Northern Dynasties period, the whole area was renamed Xingzhou. Then, not long afterwards, as soon as Yang Jian unified the country and established the Sui Dynasty, he renamed the city Zhengzhou. This was in 583, and it's by this name, given during the time of Emperor Wen of Sui, that we know it in our day. And pretty much since then, especially after the completion of the Grand Canal and Zhengzhou's location as a stop along the way, this premier city in Henan has played a similar role as America's Indianapolis, as one of the transport crossroads of the Chinese nation. This was especially true after the construction of the two major railroads built during the Qing Dynasty, the Longhai and Pinghan Railroads. We'll touch on them later on. And it was in 1928 that the warlord Feng Yuxiang officially made Zhengzhou a shi or a city. Then, as I said last time in Part 2, Zhengzhou in 1954 was named the capital of Hunan Province. And let me mention again, Zhengzhou in our day plays a front and center role in the Belt and Road's Eurasian land bridge linking China, Europe, and all countries in between. Let me also point out one more important city in Hunan. This is Xiangqiu, located in the eastern part of the province, bordering Shandong and Anhui. The mythical emperors Shannong and Xu are said to have lived in and around Xiangqiu. Qi, the second king of Xia, the son of Yu the Great, as a reward for helping his father in the taming of the floods that plagued northern Hunan, was enfiefed with lands in and around Shangqiu. The Shang Dynasty founder, King Tang, a descendant of Qi, came from this area. And uh, one more interesting piece of trivia. The people who came from ancient Shangqiu were often referred to as Shang people. And in ancient documents, it was inferred that they were supposedly quite adept at doing business. And to this day, the character Shang stands for commerce, business, and the term Shangren means a business person. So during the Zhou Dynasty, this area around Shangqiu became the state of Song. And though born in the state of Lu, the great sage Confucius had his ancestral roots in this Song state. During the Song Dynasty, Shangqiu was made a backup capital to Kaifeng and named Nanjing, or Southern Capital. No relation to the more famous Nanjing in Jiangsu province. In 1127, when the Jurchen armies overwhelmed the northern Song, it was in Shangqiu that the future southern Song emperor initially fled and set up a temporary capital in June 1127. And as we all know, he ultimately ended up in present-day Hangzhou and built his capital there. Let me uh, also briefly mention the city of Nanyang in the south of Henan, one of the great cultural centers of the province, bordering Shanxi to the west and Hubei to the south. The ancient name of Nanyang was Wan, and Nanyang got its name as one of the commanderies established there during the spring and autumn period, and it was the capital of the Shun state and the birthplace of such ancient notables as Zhuge Liang, Zhang Jie, Zhuang Zi, and Mo Zi. In giving this basic overview of the history of Henan's most important cities, we can see how central this province was throughout China's prehistory and early dynasties. However, once Song Emperor Gaozu moved the Chinese capital to the south, to Hangzhou, Henan's traditional role that it had always played going back to 2000 BCE, changed on a dime. No longer were Henan cities preferred locations to establish a government. After Kublai Khan put an end to the Song in the 13th century, from that point forward, 
and into today, too. China's seat of power moved north to Beijing, geographically located within Hebei province. And ever since the southern Song, when you could say it ended for Hunan and all these historic cities I've mentioned so many times, this ancient province became less important politically, and Hunan sort of became a poster boy for the term impoverished backwater. And in the 20th century, Hunan became China's land of disasters. When discussing all these large-scale natural and man-made disasters in Chinese history, so many wild numbers are thrown around for numbers of deaths, how many thousands or millions made homeless, died of famine, died of disease, drowned, starved. The bandwidth between low and high estimates is enormous. Well, what else can a poor boy do except parrot these numbers to you? How accurate these figures are, there's no way to know for sure. Anyone who survived a serious natural disaster knows these are the kind of things where It's not so easy to keep score. But at least when you hear these statistics, as much of a guesstimate as they may be, you'll at least understand the scale. But right after the 20th century, during the midpoint of the Guangxu Emperor's reign, one of the world's worst natural disasters happened. And by the worst, I mean it resulted in the most deaths. The 1887 Yellow River Flood. It shares the top rankings on the dreaded list of the world's worst natural disasters in human history. 50,000 square miles were inundated, an area equal in size to the great state of Alabama. 900,000 dead, 2 million homeless. The estimates are all over the place. What is there to say? The Yellow River, since time immemorial, year after year, 50... 60 billion cubic meters of water flowed from the mountains of Qinghai and Tibet all the way to the Yellow Sea. Usually, living along this mother river of China, it was a nice, bucolic existence. But not always. All summer, in northern Hunan, 1887, it rained like crazy. And so much water fell from the skies, the dikes gave way at a place called Huayuanko, basically north of Zhengzhou, maybe a 45-minute walk to get to the south bank of the Yellow River. At Huayuanko, the dikes broke, September 28th, 1887, and within a very short time, the Yellow River poured out. By the time the water stopped spreading, the flood was as big as Lake Ontario, 13th largest lake in the world. The nature of the Yellow River, well, the more the river flowed, the more silt there was that accumulated on the bottom. Hands down, it is the most sediment-laden river in the world. One to two billion tons of silt a year keeps building up. You have to dredge the river constantly. Not practical given its length, 3,400 miles. If you couldn't keep up with the dredging, They had to build those dikes on both sides of the river higher and higher. So when the dikes broke, the full force and violence of the Yellow River came down on anything in its path. And just like radioactive fallout that follows a nuclear explosion, with floods, it was a different kind of misery. And it came in two terrible forms, starvation and disease. And for this 1887 Yellow River Flood. It took till 1889 before everything was all put back together. Chiang Kai-shek was born around Ningbo on October 31st, a month after the dikes broke at Hua Yuanko in 1887. 51 years later, Chiang Kai-shek's name and the Yellow River dikes at Hua Yuanko will be mentioned in the same breath. If it's so dangerous and unpredictable, why live so close to the Yellow River? (laughs) Well, for the same reason, farmers live so close to the volcanoes. That's where the best soil is. No one wanted to leave Kaifeng, even though since the 4th century, the city has been wiped out by floods seven times. They keep rebuilding Kaifeng every time. There are six 
buried cities below modern-day Kaifeng, one built on top of the other. The 1887 flood was an extreme event, of course, but in recent history, it's sort of tag Hunan as this down-on-its-luck province. The 20th century, as far as Hunan province went, was one of deadly catastrophes. As I said, 51 years later, after the 1887 Yellow River flood, Chiang Kai-shek was the president of China. And in the summer of 1938, the Japanese military was at the top of its game and were proving unstoppable in their slow takeover of China. They had just won a victory in Xuzhou in Jiangsu province and were making a beeline west in the direction of Zhengzhou. And once they took Zhengzhou, all the Japanese army had to do was commandeer the Pinghan Railroad and take that train nonstop to Hankou, where the nationalist government was holed up following the bloody and infamous takeover of the nation's capital in Nanjing. The Japanese invasion of China began in Manchuria, 1931. Six years later, in 1937, following the Marco Polo Bridge incident, they began to spread out in a southerly direction. So with the Japanese army now on the march in Hunan, it was crucial to halt their progress and to take drastic measures, if necessary, to prevent them from taking over the nexus of the Longhua and Pinghan railroads in Zhengzhou. Once the Japanese made it to Kaifeng, well, that meant they were only an hour away from Zhengzhou by car. Where I'm from, (laughs) that's merely the distance from Laguna Beach to San Diego. If the Japanese made it to Zhengzhou, the government in Wuhan was screwed. So Jiang Kai-shek gave the order to blow up the Yellow River dikes and to let it do what it did back in 1887, more or less. Surely, Jiang knew his history and was familiar with the destruction caused in 1638 when the Ming Dynasty officials, in their desperation to wipe out the rebel Li Zicheng and his army, laying siege to Kaifeng, busted open the dikes. And you all recall what happened when that happened. Now history was about to horrifically repeat itself. The only saving grace to this extreme action was that, at least if they broke the dikes west of Kaifeng, it would block the path of the Japanese army and slow them down just long enough to allow the nationalist government to get out of Dodge and evacuate Hanko. And not just the nationalist government that was based there. There were a lot of refugees who were squatting in Wuhan after fleeing for their lives after the fall of Shanghai and Nanjing. Everyone needed enough time to pack up and get out. So June 9th, 1938, under Jiang's orders, nationalist soldiers tried to blow up the dikes. Initially, they ran into a little trouble. So strongly had they been last rebuilt. But right near the section that had been breached in 1887 at Huayuan Ko, they were able to blow a hole in the dikes. Jiang and his government knew plenty of Hunan people would die within hours. And in the days and weeks that followed, who knows how many hundreds of thousands or perhaps millions more of these poor wheat farmers and their families would also be wiped out. Water always did what it wanted to in situations like this, this scale. It was like it was like an earthquake. You had to just hold on and do all you could to survive until the worst passed. The flood headed in a southeast direction, across the central plain of China, towards the Huai River, which promptly overflowed, causing the Grand Canal to flood and suffer structural damage. In blowing up the dikes, the intention was to slow down the Japanese, which worked. Their march to Zhengzhou was halted, and there was you know, no way to pass through such devastation. In the end, from this act of hydrological warfare, all across the eastern portion of this province, the Kansas of China, where more wheat grew than anywhere else, the scale of death and destruction was beyond words. 400,000, 500,000. Again, it's, it's so hard to accurately measure the extent of the mortality in these catastrophic events. Anywhere from 
three to five million people had to go find a new place to live if they survived. And as I just said, the waters unleashed by the flood, that was merely the first phase of the torment that followed in its wake. Well, October of that year, 1938, the Japanese ended up taking Wuhan anyway. If they suffered any casualties on their end from the flood, the numbers were insignificant. But the nationalists and their armies in harm's way had bought enough time to gather their things and regroup elsewhere. The whole seat of government was moved upriver to Chongqing, and there they made their last stand till the end of the war in 1945. And it took till the following year, 1946, for the Yellow River dikes north of Zhengzhou to be put back together. And Jiang Kai-shek, in utilizing the awesome power of the Yellow River, where Chinese civilization began, joined such notables from his nation's history as Guan Yu, Cao Cao, and others from the Song and Ming dynasties who engaged in this kind of destructive hydrological warfare, using nature as a weapon against their enemies. The communists had a field day with this, and the 1938 flood was a propaganda bonanza. Besides the flooding, dozens of millions of tons of Yellow River silt spilled out across the entirety of eastern Hunan and into Jiangsu. And this man-made disaster led to the next gut punch to Hunan province. This was the 1942-1943 famine. One and a half million, two million dead, three million dead. Yeah, this was so widespread and devastating, it was impossible to know how many perished in the cities and across the Hunan countryside. The rains of 1942 didn't fall. The crops failed. Whatever little the farmers had been able to harvest ended up as food for locusts. By the winter of 1942, the pain was palpable throughout Hunan. The province was under the yoke of Japan in some parts, and then the nationalists and communists controlled their portions. So with no one single central authority who could provide disaster relief... It ended up being a perfect storm for corrupt officials to earn some profits dealing in relief supplies by enforcing a policy of coercive grain requisition from the starving peasants. Like Chiang Kai-shek's order to blow up the dikes in June 1938, this 1942-1943 famine and the failure of the government to come to the aid of the people of Hunan is another propaganda victory for the communists. You know, going back to the time of Meng Zi, it had been an accepted truth that one of the most basic moral responsibilities of the government was to ensure the people had enough food to eat. Not to grow it for them, but to create the harmony throughout the land that allowed for the people to feed themselves. And when the government failed in this fundamental responsibility, well, the people couldn't help but think, They had lost heaven's favor. In March 1943, Theodore White's story that ran in Time magazine exposed the horrors of this famine to the American public and, well, everyone else who read Time. This famine was also the subject of a 2012 movie called When Gu Ijiu Si Er, Remembering 1942. Adrian Brody in the Role as Theodore White, it was based on a 2009 Liu Zhenyun novel. And you could watch it on YouTube. In April 1944, after so many millions had been killed and tortured by this famine, when the Japanese came in for the kill in Hunan province, the demoralized Nationalist Army, after years of wreaking havoc and causing so much human pain and suffering, were turned on by the Hunan peasants. 60,000 Japanese soldiers defeated 300,000 demoralized Chinese troops. This human tragedy eh, got sort of lost in the footnotes of World War II and the Second Sino-Japanese War. Help finally came to Hunan, but it was too little too late. The whole 1942-43 famine and its aftermath was covered up, lied about, and politicized by KMT and CPC propagandists. 
The more rural the peasant, the more they suffered. Those months from December 1942 to June 1943 saw some of the worst anguish Hunan province had ever seen. The Great Chinese Famine, the San Nian Da Ji Huang, from 1959 to 1961, that was even worse. Even to this day, in 2021, this Great Chinese Famine remains the largest single man-made disaster in human history. And when people want to hate on the CPC and point to the worst of their excesses and harm caused to the people, this famine caused by the failed policies of Mao's Great Leap Forward, is what's always pointed to above all else, even more than the Cultural Revolution. The Great Chinese Famine of 1959-61 to didn't only affect Hunan, but the people there suffered more than most. Was it millions who died, or tens of millions? Depending on whose side you're on, the estimates vary considerably. The low estimate is... 15 million deaths from starvation. The southernmost city in Hunan was Xinyang, famous for their Xinyang Mao Qian Tea, which I talk about in the Tea History Podcast. I hope you're all listening to that one, too. Yeah, Xinyang was one of the places hit hardest. One in eight people died there from the famine, 12.5% of the population. Down there in southern Hunan is where the first People's Commune was established. And when Mao toured that Potemkin village and witnessed the prosperity enjoyed by the people, he decided that was the way to go and rolled this people's commune model out across the country. So some will say the Great Leap Forward started in Hunan. Anyway, I don't want to say anything else about the Great Chinese Famine because the history of this human tragedy affected more parts of China than just Hunan. Unfortunately, this famine of 1959-61 to didn't spell the end of Hunan's bad luck streak in the 20th century. There was still one more big one that happened in 1975 that maybe you heard about. Actually, I don't think this event is too well known outside of uh, China. After the communists emerged victorious in the Civil War, throughout the 1950s and 60s, they began putting China back together. Not the way it was before, but one of the things they did was to go on a major dam building binge. Just in Hunan province alone, something like 170 dams were built to aid in irrigation and flood control. If you the great could tame the chronic floods that caused so much grief to the people of the Central Plain, so could Chairman Mao. And in August of 1975, something random happened that No one could have predicted. I'm not sure how many of you remember Typhoon Nina, the fourth most deadly tropical cyclone in history. A tropical cyclone, that's the catch-all term for a hurricane, typhoon, cyclone, or tropical storm. Nina came ashore not too far from Quanzhou in Fujian, then made its way across Jiangxi to Hunan, and then up to Xinyang, the bottom of Hunan. By the time it started moving inland, Typhoon Nina was hardly the storm that it had been when it was passing over Taiwan and approaching the China coast. From Xinjiang, the storm slowly crept north. But there was this cold front just north of Juma Dian that stopped the storm in its tracks and caused it to just sit there in one spot and dump rain on the people and the land. 33 inches fell in six hours. Here in L.A., we'll get that much rain in two or three years sometimes. On this hot August night in Hunan, in the Jumadian area, a year's worth of rain fell in 24 hours. 62 dams ended up failing due to this freak of nature storm. And the biggest one to fail was called the Banqiao Dam that held back the river Ru. Around 11.30 at night, on August 7, 1975, the waters topped the dam, and it started to fail. By 1.30 a.m., there was catastrophic breaching, and once the deluge commenced, it took only 10 hours to empty out the entire reservoir. 
about 750 million cubic meters of water. Like all natural disasters of this magnitude, it's always hard to get an accurate count, but about 25 or 30,000 people died in their beds as the flood hit them head on. More than 100,000, perhaps 200,000 more people died from famine and the cruel after-effects of the flood. How many died from the Banqiao Dam disaster and how many died from Typhoon Nina's wrath? Who's to know? This all happened during the tail end of the Cultural Revolution and it took till 1993 to put the dam back together and for that part of Hunan to bounce back and for some semblance of normalcy to return to the land. Like most all of these interior provinces, Hunan missed out on all the foreign export trade because they lacked a coastal port. And for that reason mainly, they always lagged behind their eastern neighbors. And in 2021, they're still playing catch up. Zhengzhou, this city of 10 million people, isn't doing too bad. Again, thanks mostly to Zhengzhou's role in the Belt and Road Initiative that placed a booster rocket under the economy of this ancient and modern city. You know, we sort of jumped around all over the place with this three-part overview. If I attempted to dig deeper down into the history of Hunan, this series could have gone on forever. I hope you were able to get somewhat of, a, of an understanding of the role this province played over the millennia. If you should ever find yourself in Chengzhou, I urge you to spend a day at the Hunan Provincial Museum, second biggest one in China. So let us abruptly bring the curtain down here. The history of Hunan is still being written, and I thought it best to just take it as far as the 20th century and then come back in another 60, 75 years and freshen things up. If you knew little or nothing about Hunan province prior to listening to this series, I hope you got a good sense of the importance of this place in Chinese history. Hey, don't forget to check out the Tea History Podcast. Follow it in your favorite podcast app or just go to the website at teacup.media. And while you're there, browse the CHP store and get yourself a t-shirt, a hat, a mug. Hey, whatever you buy goes to support the work I'm doing. Until the next time, this is once again Laszlo Montgomery signing off from Los Angeles in sunny California, IA. Please consider coming back for more where this came from. There's plenty of it. New topic and everything next time. I'll see you then, I hope, for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.